Anyway, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Hopefully, and let's see, Eddie, you need one of li these. Oh, you got, oh I'm so, Eddie and Wayne, I'm sorry. It's just, the, it's, just, yeah, it's just the scripture, so that, yeah, the, the, this way, so that we're all on the same page uh, scripture wise. And just remember, we are, uh, re, excuse me, we record this. This video goes up every week. It's on our website. If you want some uh, links to it, they, they can be found, or you can uh, give us a buzz or send me an email, and uh, we'll hook you up with that. All right, what I want to start off with tonight is just kind of reminding you what we're, we're thinking about, and that is that my life and your life as followers of Christ are different. In fact, Paul says it this way, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. So my life ought to be meaningfully different than it would have been outside of Christ. And in truth, everything that's, that's connected with me, that's a significant part of me, ought to also be markedly different, candidly, including our families. So if, if you are a mom and dad that are followers of Christ, that family ought to look differently than those that aren't. Unfortunately, too many times we are so influenced and we are so cultured by everything that's going on around, there's so many things that we aren't thinking about and we're kind of riding on autopilot. And many times what we do is land in a particular spot and place in life uh, with a whole slew and series of regrets, thinking, well, I wish I coulda, didda, all these things. The goal is, and what we're trying to encourage uh, through this process, is to think with the end in mind. And those of you that are already further down the road, to think about how it is in terms of the end for your adult children, for your uh, grandchildren, ways in which you can impact them so that their life and their family's life is different because of a connection with Jesus. All right, so there's a very number of topics we're talking about. Last week, one of the things that we did was talk about family size, and so we expect to be hearing some pregnancy news uh, in, the near, in the near future. And so... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, <laughs> anyway, but hopefully the aim, though, was to lead people to, to think, and, and hopefully you would have left last week or you would watch last week and said, you know, some of that I haven't necessarily thought about because so much of it, we, we just aren't. We're, we're kind of, uh, we're just on the treadmill and we're doing life like everybody else, and the goal is to get you to think. And so tonight... Uh, the goal also is to get you to think, and we're not talking about uh, child or family size, but tonight thinking about money, so about dollars and cents. And my task to start off tonight is to lead you to look. We're going to look at the first three passages. We'll look at the last one uh, near the end. But what I want to do is let's just start. Um, and the Bible says a whole lot about money, and there's a stack of passages that we could look at or could have looked at, but we're just going to look specifically at these three to begin with. And the first comes to us from 1 Timothy chapter 6. I gave it to you on your page so that we're all looking at the same thing. Just in terms of translations, my favorite is the CSB. And so if you're looking for a new Bible, a new translation, I think it's, it's my favorite one on the market. So I, anyway, I like it. 1 Timothy 6 verses 6 through 10. Paul says this, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. If we have food and clothing... We will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. All right, so this verse is telling us some stuff. God is telling us some stuff in this verse about money. So as you look at that, what's it telling us about money? The root of all evil. No. Does it say it's the root of all evil? The love of money. Yeah, well, it says that the love of money. So we need to... Um, in fact, that's probably... This is not probably language necessarily that we, we... You probably wouldn't say it that way. How would you rephrase that in today's vernacular? Well, the love of money is what? How would you say it? Would you say it's the root of all evil, or of all sorts of evil? Yeah. You might. Bad. Do what? Do what? It's, it's love of money, bad. Uh, <laughs> how about this? Can be. Good job, Roger. So. 
let me ask you this. Is this text telling us that money is bad? No. All right, so I think we have to note that. It's not saying... And that's important because... Why is that important? Well, we got to have it. Everything has a price tag. And everything really has always had a price tag. In case you haven't noticed, your price tags are getting bigger. Anyway, so what else is this passage telling us? I'm sorry? All right, so... Um, Godly contentment is desirable. How about that? Or, or I mean, good. Godly I mean, contentment, good. All right, so when we're talking about contentment, we use that word regularly, but let's make sure we're on, on the same page. What are we talking about when we say contentment? Yeah, I'm satisfied. So that, that what I have, I'm okay with. And so if I had more, that might be fine. But if I don't have more, I'm okay. All right, so what else is this telling us? What can't you take with you? You can't take anything. And by inverse, this, this is also telling us um, you won't be here forever. So you checked in, and there's a checkout. You may have early checkout, you may have late checkout, but there's always checkout. What does it say? What else? Happy Content. Yeah, it's part of contentment. What else? All right. Um, All right, so pursuit of wealth can be a trap. Anything else you'd say you see? So we can... Um, so we can it foolishly, and by inverse, we can use it wisely. What else? Pay attention. To, in fact, zero in on verse ten. Is there anything else that you would say? In fact, there's there's one that I'm looking for. This is this is how I'd say it. Money has spiritual consequence, or can have spiritual consequence. In fact, can have grave spiritual consequence, right? Because he's, he's describing that it has to, the, 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 the love of money has caused how many? Well, some, he said, have wandered away from the faith and are experiencing, he says, pierce themselves with many griefs. What does that mean? You can... Uh, that you can with money experience real trouble and grief. Some of you might say, well, I've tried it without it. I'd like to try it, <laughs> I'd like to try it with it. Um, I wish I could remember what's on the... I can't remember. It was funny this morning. Just think something very funny this morning. Anyway, all right, look at the next verse, Proverbs 22.7. Proverbs has a ton of statements about wealth, but look at this one. Proverbs 22, 7, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is a slave to the lender. Uh, specifically, I want you to notice something there about debt. It's saying something about debt, isn't it? Well, um, <laughs> let me back up to say this, though. And we're not, I, I didn't and I won't bore you with a whole stack of verses and to play Bible drill tonight. 
the Bible consistently assumes that in life we're going to experience some indebtedness. Excuse me. It is today. It has been uh, in the past. And like um, there are... Um, There are ways that you can limit your exposure to debt, but it is, it's very, very, very difficult, even in small ways. Because uh, a lot of times, like in, in American life and culture, we think about indebtedness, like we think about uh, mortgage loans, um, car loans, uh, college loans, credit cards, furniture loans, I mean, all kinds of loans that people are taking out today. Um, but even in third world countries, what kind of loans are there? Well, well <laughs> but, but it could be something very simple. Um, I don't have enough corn, and so I'm indebted to you for this. And so um, you remember Popeye days, I will gladly pay you Tuesday for a hamburger today. Um, so it seems that consistently the Bible assumes that we're going to experience debt, but when it says that debt excuse me, um, the borrow is a slave to the lender. When you experience slavery, uh, what's one of the biggest disadvantages of being a slave? Lack of freedom. Lack of freedom. So, I want to think about that in particular tonight, though, that your financial decisions past, present, or future, among the things that can happen is that it can limit your choices, drastically limit your choices. And from a spiritual perspective, what we want to think about though specifically is that there may very well be things that God would want you and your family to do that sometimes get off the table because why? We, we, we've reined in ourselves and we've, we've closed too many doors. All right, so look at the next verse. This comes to us from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, starting with verse 19. Jesus says, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, you should store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, destroys and where thieves don't break in and steal. For where your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, what does this tell us? All right, so. Well, it does seem like we're the richest money possible. We've got to work for it. That's my perspective. I'll write it and then I'll tell you what it says. I'm using the word kingdom intentionally, and if you want, to, well, th those videos aren't, we don't record those, but uh, in the mornings I'm, I'm walking through the Sermon on the Mount with, those, uh, group, with that group, and if there is one word that summarizes and links everything in the Sermon on the Mount together, it's the word kingdom. And it is that if you have a kingdom, you have a king. In this case, if we're followers of Jesus, he's our king. A king has a kingdom, and so there are citizens, there are subjects. And one of the perks, the benefits of being king is that you get to establish rules, the norms. And so if you're a follower of Jesus, one of the things that he's done is to establish his kingdom. He's the one that's in charge. He's establishing norms and the parameters, the boundaries that we're to operate in. And uh, with that in mind, in the context of all that, that talk, he's describing and speaking about money and material possessions here in a general sense and saying that kingdom citizens ought not be most concerned with this stuff. That doesn't say that we shouldn't be concerned at all because we, we need stuff. And how much does stuff cost? We cost something and we, we need some money and we, we're, we're going to have some stuff. But we ought to be most concerned not with this stuff, but kingdom stuff. Why? Well, you, you, that stuff you can take with you. Um, what else is he saying though? Stuff here is temporary. So it's temporary on a variety of different levels. It can be temporary because you don't have it forever, so you're a holder of it temporarily. But also, uh, stuff that you have can be lost. 
How quickly? It can be very quickly. I mean, you can be rich one day and poor the next. Um, you can um, have your stuff taken. You can have stuff over time that just, I mean, there's very few things that get better over time, except for Debbie. There you go. Debbie. <laughs> Frank didn't say anything. Oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> Think about the finish line, Frank. Think about the finish line. <laughs> You know what? Because you won't be here forever. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so the, the, the stuff here is temporary because uh, you're not going to be here forever, and the market ebbs and flows. You there's a good harvest, and then there's a famine. There is a uh, stock market boom, and then the stock market tanks. There's all of these things where it's up and down. And so the, the goal is, and what Jesus is trying to get me to you and, and even in our families to think, is that we need to start thinking about and making sure, not that we don't pay any attention to dollars and cents, that we never look at our checkbook balance, that we don't think about retirement. It's not suggesting that at all, but it's not that those things shouldn't matter. Rather, they shouldn't matter most. Um, Eleven is okay. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes. If he's talking about storing up treasure, he's not talking about having enough to live on. So it's more about what else do you need besides your basics? Are you worried about the future? It seems to be about what you're gathering, what you're what you're hoarding in there. Um. Yes. Um, Whatever takes your eyes away from God would be. I'm trying to think what. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this because it says where your treasure is, your heart is also. Um, So where you're storing, whether it's here or there, indicates what you most value. All right. I wanted to kind of get these on the plate of your mind, of your thinking, so that Caroline can lead you to think some more. Am I writing for you, or are you writing for yourself? Yeah, I'll get when you write. Yeah, everybody does. <laughs> hey, let me turn your microphone on. thought is talking about what does our culture say about money and material possessions what does it say about what would you say our culture says about money and stuff greed is good more is better all right so yeah I, yeah I think that's a great one that money is equal success the more money you have the more successful you are yeah Power, yeah. So, the more money you have, obviously, the more power you have, or influence. So, the money can buy anything. What about debt? Oh, it's okay. Because yeah. most people are it's like, it's like, way into debt. A monthly payment, you know, of twenty nine ninety nine for the rest of your life, you know. Like, exactly. Right. Yeah. A lot of times, before you're even like married or right, like I mean, you can accrue a ton of debt as a young person. Well, and to right? and to Michelle's yeah. point, that that I mean, I think for many, it is the debt is the only way, and you can't do anything without it.
But they're not thinking about that when they're buying their car, no, right? No, they're no, not no, thinking no, about the no, upcoming, no, right? Well, so our culture would say about money and stuff, think about when. And now. Yeah. Now. now. Immediate gratification, like. Yeah. That's 16 tons. That's Tennessee Ernie Ford. Yeah, and deeper debt. So I sold my soul to the company store. I think that's good. Do you have your hand up, Jamie? But society also kind of looks at it as the more money you have, the more work you have. Yeah. But, which is almost like the success and power of influence. Yeah. Well, and like, kind of like what Owen Christopher said is that, like, there's this need creep. That was the only way we could figure out how to talk about it. Like, think about the needs that our parents had compared to what we think we need. Are, like, you, are you still on this one or are you we're moving to the next one? No, we're still on this okay. one. Okay. It's like you're, the, as time passes, need increases. Like technology. You're like, on, like the phone. No, that's true. You're, you're what you think you need or, or what the culture makes you think you need. But like current culture, I mean, certainly need has changed in recent, I mean, how we define this has changed. Right. So what, what, think of some ways in which the, the need elevator has occurred. But your phone number did have, how many digits? Oh, it started with letters. You had letters? What? Karen, you grew up on Hee Haw. I was like, this is where I am. The, um, and like, older is not good. Like, you do not want a, um, I have champagne gold kitchen cabinets. <laughs> like, like, that was not going to be on HGTV anytime soon, right? Like, that was in 1961. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes. Wall, everything. <laughs> Who knew pink wouldn't be in style, you know, 80 years <laughs> later? <laughs> but either, old is not valued as new. You've got to have something new. Newer is better. And new every couple of years or every yeah. year or every six months. I mean, the newest version comes out mm -hmm. that one. Yeah. 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 Someone can move to like, what does our culture like, what does it produce? What, how does it affect our mindset? It's, it's kind of, it's, yes, and I think, like, when Christopher was talking, I was thinking entitlement, right? Like, spoiled entitlement. Yes. Yes. And it's silly because, like, I'm 43 years old. I've got all these kids. And, like, when um, people come to my house, I almost am like, <laughs> like, come on in. You know, like, this, this is how we live, right? Like, this is, it's like I feel like I have to give a disclosure that, like, yeah, this, and this is how we live. We really like paneling, and, <laughs> like, this is, but the, um, and that's silly, because that doesn't say who I am, uh, and, but um, I, th I think that you can see this lack of contentment with what we do have, because it says I've been blessed to get to go to um, some impoverished countries, and they would love to have my champagne gold kitchen. They'd love to have that indoor stove and clean water. I think it's a need to go like, well, it might be a little bit silly, but like an antidote, because like, you know, your kid's asking for something, right? Because somebody else already has that, and you're like, well, if it's the Lord's way, they're getting, they can't get that. Like, you know, that's not going to happen. But maybe in here, 
Oh, yeah. It's like she said, you know, a friend or a kid had, like, the newest iPad. And, you know, Nate comes home or whoever comes home and says, I want the newest iPad on the box. And, you know, we're like, you know, you got Sell a kidney. next to newest. You don't need the newest. Oh. You know, and it's like parents nowadays, you know, they want to give in what their kid wants. But what I find interesting about that conversation is that we're talking about a four year old. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. I couldn't hear you. Oh. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We're talking about four year olds that now want ding, ding, ding. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, if I see it, I want it. Why is that? Why do they want it? Because their friends. Somebody else has it. Somebody else has it. Like, we are inundated with this messaging, right? Like, I mean, the television, even if they're on their tablet playing a game, I mean, it is pumping this messaging out that, like, you have to have this. You have to have this. Right, right. But we buy into it. Right. Because we don't have to. I saw an advertisement this afternoon. I told her, I said, advertisement's not extra treatment like we're really idiots. It was, if I get uh, Hulu and all these things, my credit score is going to go up because I'm paying bills that I have to pay anyway. <laughs> well, <I'm not> <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute, you got to be kidding me. Let's go out and pay for Hulu and pay for all this because my credit score is going to go up because now I'm paying for bills that I have to pay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are you doing with the rest of the bills? But that's it's the world is treating us through advertisements and through uh, the media that we're not very bright at all. And that's why this, I think, when we see it, we want it, because we've got to keep up. If we don't, we think, uh oh, I'm not bright now. I'm really not going to be bright. If I don't have this or I don't have that, I'm just going to take another step backwards in today's world, technology-wise or thought process-wise or whatever. I'm going the wrong direction. One of the things I read when we were preparing for some of these uh, uh, is that uh, somebody said, you, you want to see how we've changed with possessions. Look how many storage unit places there are. Oh, yeah. I was like, I was like, <laughs> right, but I mean, like, like the, the ridiculous amount of storage, like you're paying a monthly fee to store stuff that you don't use. Exactly. And, and many people have multiplied storage units that they're paying monthly for for stuff that they don't use. That's, I, I had not thought about because you do, you see them popping up on corners like crazy. Oh, and even because when we moved here, we moved into like a late 1930s home. And um, like, it was cute. And we had to move pretty fast because it was at Christmas time. And so we bought this house. Well, we didn't know we were going to have more children. And the closets were like this. And like the linen closet was like this. And there was one of them for the whole house. And our, you know, the closets were this big. Well, now we're in a 60s home. And they figured it out in the 60s. You get a little more, <laughs> you know, and now like, those of you who have walk-in closets, yeah, like people didn't have as many clothes back then. They didn't need these huge spaces for their shoes and their purses and their clothes. And I, I do feel sorry for the generation that's growing up on Pinterest. I think Pinterest is cool, very interesting. However, it is skyrocketing the cost of weddings because people think, oh, oh, I have to have this. I have to have this extreme wedding that like then you're in debt like and it's one it's one day and you're still married even if it's not a very expensive way I can dress it like I have a granddaughter that is engaged and looking to get married they went she I don't know why but I'm just gonna they went to Hilton and they got a price from Hilton Hill for their wedding just for the facility twenty six thousand dollars just for the facility they wouldn't even talk to us. They said, this is the only conversation we will have with you because we will, will no longer deal with you. We'll, we will only talk to and negotiate with a professional wedding planner. <laughs> by the time they added in, that was another six grand, you know, minimum. And then they, that, this didn't include food. Now, when they added food, they were talking about $48,000. And I asked my son, who had died? <laughs> and I got money. Because, and he said, nobody. He said, we're not going that route. But that's how expensive it can get very quickly. And compare that. When Michael's parents got married, they got married on Sunday after church. 
along with several other, cu other couples. <laughs> like it was like, uh, it's your turn, right? Like that's, yeah. that, that's how expensive or how, it wasn't. It, it, it didn't put you in debt. It wasn't, that wasn't celebrated. That wasn't a thing, but that's incredible. What are some other traps of things that have increased over time, like weddings? What are some traps? Divorce. Say it again. Divorce. <laughs> I haven't checked how much that's going for right now, so I don't know. It's, 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 it's very it's expensive. A, <laughs> uh, huh? Oh my goodness. And are they employable after that, uh, right? Like, are they employable after that? Very costly education. And it doesn't make sense because many trade schools, you could live at home, pocket all that money yeah. so that you and can, get a job afterwards. right, and then you have a skill set, but it is, it is looked down upon. Well, but, but, in trade schools, you can get jobs while, because you get an apprenticeship while you're getting your education. And they'll pay for your education many times. Exactly. <laughs> so it's yeah, like, even, it's even the colleges have fallen into this. I mean, have y'all ridden through High Point University's campus? Oh, I mean, it is, I mean, it's, it, it's, it is, and but like. Well, and a lot of times the cost of these universities have to go up in order to keep their sports going. Yeah. Well, that's not going to help my kid get a job, the fact that they had an incredible football team. But education, what else? What are some other things that have gone up over time that's well, like, doctor, say it again? Medical. Oh, wow, yes, medical expenses. Housing, housing. housing is up, cars. Well, but even having to have two vehicles is kind of a, that's a cultural thing. Child care. Children in general. Yeah. And for men's men, it's currently having a thousand and what dollars per month. For men's men, it's a thousand dollars. So just for us, um, wow. this school year. So two kids, two grand equally. Yes, yes. Which is, I mean, why do both parents work? What, yeah. Well, that's that's something that that's that's this. What was your example like? Well, like, I mean, you can do sports, or you can do taekwondo, or you can do gymnastics, or whatever. I can't do it all. It all kind of adds up. Where we like played with our neighbors, right? Yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. The popular kid had the ball. <laughs> yeah. But uh, to uh, yeah. both parents work is a consequence. Yeah. And then extracurricular activity. We talked a little bit about that last week. Yeah. It's, it's particularly organized stuff. I mean, kids have always played games, but now it's. Um, and it's gotten more accessible when you're too. It used to be, you know, when I paid $500 a kid, it was $5 for the feeding. Now they want $40 for the meal. Well, and it's easier and where you go. And but, can you play, but can you play soccer with the kids in this area? No, you, you need have to play. To you have to play with the ones in Oregon, yeah. and so. Uh, so they can charge for to play football in high school now. It used to be, it was if you played football in high school, that was free. Right. Now you have to pay to play football. In boosters. No, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you pay for your equipment, your your yeah. uniform, boosters. I mean, everything. Like, and even think about birthdays. I was laughing about this. Did anybody else in here have a Burger King birthday when they were young? Yeah. Like you. No. You basically got a crown, you got your burger, and you got to see how the milkshake machine worked, right? And that was like the talk of the school. It was like, that's what we did. Oh, it was the thing. All of us want to go to Burger King. We were like, are you having a Burger King party? You went to Burger King? I, went, I was very happy with my Burger King birthday. Not, not McDonald's? I got the crown. I got a Oh yeah, Chuck E. Cheese. The only birthday party I ever had was at McDonald's, and I thought it was so cool. Like I got to see the freezer; it was a walk-in freezer. I thought that was amazing. <laughs> they give you a tour. Yeah, it is nice. 
And the birthday child was like first with great pride. But it, was, and it was a joint <laughs> birthday party with my sister. And so. Oh, um, but like now, what do birthday parties look like for children? Oh, that's, yeah. Heaven forbid we go to the park. You can rent yeah. out bounce houses and, uh, you know, swimming pools and whatever. I mean, it's crazy. And Frank, you're the oldest. <laughs> All right, when you were a kid, what did you get for Christmas? What did I get for Christmas? Yeah, like what would a normal, like a Christmas as Frank, uh, as, a, as an eight-year-old, what did you get? I know I had one grandmother that always got me a shirt. So you got a shirt? I got a shirt. And mom and dad would get me a truck for, I actually got an uh, electric train one year. Uh, but electric trains back then weren't nearly as expensive as they are now. So you got a shirt and a train. train. And that was about it. <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot. And was something homemade? Did you get something homemade? Well, I made it myself. <laughs> we, took an we took an orange and put cloves in it yeah, we did and put a piece of ribbon on it and then yeah, yeah that was to make yeah. my father so we think so that was but that was from one grandmother that was children so well, I got, if I didn't want it I could take a little bit of the orange <laughs> You can drown in the holidays, like financially. And it's not even like, even if you can keep it down, because people show love by different ways. And I think now a lot of people show love by giving gifts, probably because our culture is inundating with this message that these grandchildren have to have this or they're not going to be smart. So that makes you a great granddad? Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, six months ago. Uh, so I figured if I just spent on each $50 a piece for Christmas, everybody in the family, I'd be spending close to $1,000 just for each person to get $50. And just for that. So I think, boy, that's a family. So everybody's getting an orange and clove, so they're close to the same. And instructions on you know, a piece of ribbon, on instructions on how to do it. It can get expensive, so we finally just had a talk with the family. Said, "Look, it's just beyond what we can do now because they're all wanting more than what we could get." So it's okay. just precious. It's all of this is just so precious. Well, and think about what did vacations look like when you were a kid? Every year, a trip to Lake Erie. Yeah, too nice to do the too nice. I, know, I went every year. We went to the beach. Yeah, we went. What kind of place did you stay at the beach? It was, it was a what? In the El Camino. I know. I said we had a KOA. I saw we had a KOA. Like a little condo community that we had. Yeah. But, but we went to the same place every year. Well, what do, what do the vacations look like now? Uh, oh, I don't know. 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 I don't and it's like, even if you can keep it in bounds in your own family, having to navigate extended family, it's tough conversations, right? Like to say, hey, like I love you, but we need to like reel it in a little bit. Um, so this is how we would like to do Christmas. Like that, those are tough conversations to initiate, but they're important because it is, it sucks the joy out of holidays when you're trying to please people with gifts and stuff. When in truth, none of us really need anything. Really, we don't need anything. Oh yeah, like, technology, you know, technology. Like, no offense, Beth, but like when he was, you know, growing up and had his own, his heart wasn't like the iPhone. He didn't have eight. one. <laughs> he didn't have a phone. Yeah, well, no, he like, had to okay, sleep. Well, 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 <laughs> like when they had phones growing up, like the little phones were Frankie, the Frank used to climb the pole. Those and probably yeah. weren't the thousand dollars and broke easily. Right. Whereas nowadays, you know, the iPhones are the iPhones. Five hundred dollars, and you drop it one time, and it's out. Could you just go back in time to the bad phone? 
Well, and honestly, well, think about think about with, for example, with cell phones. I'm, within my when my family, the first person to get a phone was my sister, and she got a bag phone. And I remember specifically having this conversation. I said, you're an idiot. Why do you need that? There's phones everywhere. And so there's, there's phones here. There's phones at work. There's pay phones everywhere. Who yeah, needs that, that was her kid. You should take And that's like, what's the problem? Yeah. Anyway. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like kids nowadays, you say pay phone, and they're like, pay for his phone. You know? Yeah, but so now could, there's like, more phones so everywhere. Because I could just here's say, a quarter, call someone who cares. They don't know what to do with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Is it? Uh, nobody has changed on them anyway, so it's like nobody will be able to use it. <laughs> and like all of this, but like, I, I, like, but Karen's saying it's like the, the weight of that, the gravity of all that has an effect on us. It makes us less generous. Uh, it certainly affects tithing. If you are already leveraged to the hilt, the idea of giving even 10% sounds impossible. It, it, it affects us. So how does it affect the family? Absolutely. What did you, I didn't. Absolutely. And we have more than anyone has ever had, and we are less content than the generations before us. And temper flares. I couldn't hear you. Temper flares. Yes, because all the stress mm -hmm. and the busyness that this creates, because both people have to work in order to afford this culture or this mindset. When I think, though, too, there's the expectation, like we mentioned High Point University a while ago, so like if you have come from a, uh, you don't necessarily have to come to, from a well-to-do family to be able to go there because it's possible to incur massive amounts of, of debt, so you can come out owing $150,000, $200,000, but how, how nice is that campus? I mean, it's insane. And so when you graduate, what type of lifestyle do you expect to have? Yeah, so you, th you think I'm, I'm not going to live in a van down by the river, so. Which is fascinating because I graduated in the year 2000. We didn't have air conditioning in our, like, where we live. We didn't even have air conditioning. And it's like, that's unheard of now. And that hasn't been that long. It is. It's increased stress. Both parents have to work. Lack of commitment, of uh, contentment. What about time? Is it more time or less time with the children? Our goal tonight was to be encouraging. So, um, <laughs> and how does it affect their mindset of children? You don't ever. Yep. You either don't want any, or you want very few, because there's a price tag with all this stress. And I feel like when I've had a conversation with Maddie in the last couple of weeks, even at 15, even at 20, even the ones with kids later in life, and now, like, it takes because it's super stressed when I'm in, and she's paying money that, you know, goes out every month to pay for things that not so much as want. You should take her, to, take her to the nursing home. So you say, uh, you want somebody to come see you, or maybe so that you don't have to go here. So have, a, have some tutoring. No, no, I'll just help her out. Because um, that'll be the first place I get through. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me? Yeah. All right. Look at the next verse on your sheet, that Matthew 6, 24. Again, this is coming from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, No one can serve two masters, since he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve both God and money. Um, one of the things that was an aim tonight was to lead you, among other things, to think. we talked about this um, last week, the extent to which we are cultured 
and we are operating under a torrent of culture. If it's Pinterest, it's, I mean, Facebook ads, it's YouTube ads, it's commercials. I mean, it, we're, we're inundated with this constant messaging. Uh, that it is reinforcing all the things that we, that, that big list that we came up with. And um, you're hearing that, and what we want you to realize is to at least, or attempt to do, is just press the pause button, step back and evaluate for a little bit. Because based on what Jesus says here, one of, I think, two things is true. Either money will serve you or you will serve money. And in the end, money should be a means to an end. It's a tool. At the end of the day, money is either, it's not either positive or negative. It's neutral. You, you, you got to have it. And so you can either have it as a tool, as a resource, as a means, or you can be under its thumb. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is, in fact, all this stuff, all the effect, how common is this stuff? Well, I think it's incessantly common, ridiculously common, because unfortunately people are, and too many families, even too many Christian families are under the thumb, or money has, is, is calling the shots. Uh, they're under the, the, the management, the effectively in, in, enslaved to, to money. Um, how you view, how you manage money and material possessions is going to have a meaningful significant impact, either liberating or constraining uh, on your choices, particularly those in your family. Um, this, this whole series that we're working on is just kind of uh, figuring it out as we go along because we haven't, we haven't done this before. Next week we're talking, we, we talked about initially like game plan, what are some topics and some issues and some things that we want to deal with. And we were talking about um, like what, what should come next. And uh, Kian was making the case for some why, why we should talk about this. And it was my opinion that we ought to talk about money next and, or, and tonight because uh, the reality is that your position and how you operate and the role that money has in your family has a huge effect on any and everything else. In fact, there are so many things that become either on, or either they remain on the table or they get off the table because of decisions that you make about money or because of perspectives that you have about money. Um, think about this. What if God were to lead you to have a larger family? Some would say, I can't do that. Why? Can't afford it. Can't afford it. They cost too much or we're already leveraged to the hilt. What if God put a burden on your heart to homeschool? <laughs> but, 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 but many would say, oh, I can't do that because if, if, if you homeschool, what does that mean? Work. Somebody, somebody's got to be, somebody's got to school them. And so if two people are working, that means somebody has got to, to not work. Um, what if you believe that God is burdening you, I mean, to the uh, nursing home question a while ago, instead of entrusting a loved one's care to, to a, some facility where it's still within your ability or power to take care of them, what if God puts on your heart that this should be something that you do? It may be that some would say, well, I can't do that because I can't afford to do that. And so even if I get a burden about this, many would say, well, yeah, that, that's just not going to happen because sometimes it's because too much debt. Sometimes it's because there's too many things that you still want to have, too many things that you want to get, too many things that you're, you're hoping to purchase or to be able to possess. And your financial decisions can either make some of these possible or render them effectively impossible. Um, I don't think I have ever actually said anything brilliant. I no. Think. Yeah, no, I haven't. And so, um, but, uh, you know, the cliche is that even broken clocks are right twice a day. And something uh, I said, I don't remember the first time I said it, but it has uh, stuck with me. And it's something that I have repeated many times in a whole slew of different conversations about a whole stack of different things with people and in a counseling session is, is this. Make the decisions that keep the most doors open. Make the decisions that keep the most doors open. And there's a ton of different ways in which that can apply. But you and I need to, and in your families, you need to think about money in ways that keep the most doors open. And why do I say that? Um, a couple things I wrote down here. And the first is this. Realize you're paying a price for something. You are. Just know what it is. And so your perspectives, your priorities about money and material possessions, they're having an impact on your family 
positively or negatively. So there's a price being paid, and so it is either that you are paying a price in that you have less stuff and less money to have an increased investment in family, or your family many times is experiencing, or you're paying a cost with family to be able to have more stuff and more things, to have fancier trips, to, to go to do all, all, all these uh, excessive things. And so it may be that your priority of family is resulting in you having fewer things. It may be that the priority of money is impeding the health of your family. You're paying a cost one side of the equation or, or, the, or the other. You need to prayerfully say, all right, God help me to see the truth about where I'm paying the, the, the cost. And so here's, here's the, the next one. And to me, this is, this is kind of where the rubber meets the road in terms of application for the family. If God burdened you to make a decision regarding your family that involved financial cost, whatever it is, if God burdened you, and we talked about like if it's to have more children, if it's to homeschool, if it's to care for an aging parent, adopt. If, if it is to adopt, it is to... Um, a stack, I mean, you, you, we, we could come up with a lengthy list of things. If God put a burden on your heart relative to your family to make a decision that involved a financial cost, I'm not asking you to make this or to answer this out loud, but think about what the answer to this is. Would you be willing to pay that price? So if God put a burden on your heart, and I promise you, I'm not deciding this because these are decisions, some of them that we have made, but just as an example, if God put it on your heart that I want you to, uh, to homeschool, and that required, instead of two people working, one person work, is that if God put that burden on your heart, that's going to involve financial cost. Are you willing to pay that price? That's a big question, isn't it? In fact, what does the answer to that question tell you? And it has, it has nothing to do with homeschool. I mean, what, but what does the answer to that question tell you? It tells you what, what, what matters. It really does. And, and not, it's just what value is, and that shows you where your heart is. I want to say something, too. Don't think it'll be easy. Like, just because God calls you to do something, don't think it will be easy. Like, you know, I feel great joy in walking away from my job that pays more than my husband's and our health insurance. It, it is a sacrifice, but if God puts a burden on your heart and you answer that, he will see you through this. And um, there's countless testimonies in this room and th throughout the kingdom of people who've done that. But it's like, um, I think that sometimes when I'm talking to people, they, they think that it'll be easy if God called them to do that. And I have found in my life that that's the exact opposite. If God has called me to do something, it's actually very hard. Well, and it goes back to something we said the last week, that consistently uh, in the New Testament in, in painting the picture of what the Christian life looks like, one word especially characterizes Christian living, and that's this word, sacrifice. And the cost of following Jesus always involves cost. Salvation is free, but following Him is costly. And regularly, He is leading us to, in His own words, to deny ourselves and things that may be personal dreams or aspirations or things that otherwise we might have been doing or planning or hoping or desiring, that we say no to that because He's got something different in store for us. Uh, and sometimes that involves a financial cost. My encouragement for you, our encouragement for you, is to think about uh, your perspectives, uh, how money is being managed within your home and in your family, realizing it is having an impact on your family. And in the first session, we talked about what could, that God has plans and purposes for what not only could be but should be for your family. Decisions that you are making about finances, sometimes they're either keeping the door open or sometimes they're closing them. Um, we operate in a, in a culture of, that's driven by possessions where, to Chris's point earlier, the, um, the success is determined by what you have and what your 401k statement uh, reads. Um, there's so much easy credit. I mean, you, you can finance anything now. It used to be you could finance a car and a, um, and a house, but you can finance anything. Um, look on QVC. You can finance, I mean, it's six easy payments of whatever. You can go to the mattress store and, well, now they, talk, they cost $8 million. You have to finance those, but um, financing mattresses, I mean, could you imagine you're telling your parents that, you know, back in the day that they were going to be doing something like that? We are inundated with this messaging, and I'm encouraging you to do this. Ask God to help you see what you really treasure. And to help you answer this question, 
God, if you put a burden on our family's heart to do something differently than how we're doing it now, and it involved a cost of dollars and cents, would I pay that? If the answer that God helps you to see is no, that's telling you something about your priorities. It's saying that money is too high and that as a follower of Jesus in families that are different and people that are different because of a relationship with Christ, there's some shifting that needs to happen. Now, in a, a thousand different ways we could have talked about uh, money tonight and uh, financial planning and uh, coupons and um, retirement and savings accounts and stock market and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, the goal was not to get down to the nitty gritty on some of these things because there's absolutely a place for that, but to think about the starting point, big high level perspective about money and finances because uh, your perspective about this. It's so many times driven by culture, many times we're not thinking about it. And my hope is, long after we leave tonight, that you start thinking about some of these things and realize how much you've been affected and so that your family is operating differently because you're a follower of Jesus. Any brilliant comments, questions? Well, thank you for being here tonight. I was, I was intent that we were gonna get out early, but we didn't. I'm sorry, well, I'll let you out now. Let me pray, all right? Thank you, Lord, for letting us meet together to think together tonight. And I pray that our thinking um, continues long after we leave tonight and that you would guide our thinking and that we would get some quiet time, if it's not tonight, that we would make some time tomorrow to specifically ask you this question. Lord, if you wanted our family to do something different than how we're operating today and it involved a financial cost, would I be willing to pay it? And if the answer to that is no, help us to see that. Help us then to say, you know what, something needs to change and ask you for the courage and the wisdom to make the adjustments necessary to get our perspective of money and finances and stuff where it needs to be. After all, this is not our ultimate home. We're just passing through. So we say this to you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.